Good morning, family. It's good to see you this morning. Let's stand up together. We'll begin our time in, in song, singing to Jesus. Our one comfort in life and death is to belong to him and to him alone. That's what we're going to talk about together today. Let's sing this. Good morning, Sun family. Good morning. Hello, hello. I have my voice projects. Oh, there we go. Hello. It is so good to see you all this morning. My name is David. I'm a member here at Summit, and I have the privilege of welcoming you all to church this morning. Every morning, we choose to rehearse this same welcome because it recenters our hearts on what is most true about us in Christ that we have an ally, that we have a friend. And so whatever you come into church with this morning, let these words wash over you. Let them be your hope. If you are feeling weary and need rest, if you're mourning the loss of something and longing for comfort, if you feel worthless and wonder if God even cares, if he even sees you, if you fail and need strength, if you sin and need a savior, then this is the place to be because we worship the risen and ruling King Jesus and he is the ally of his enemies. He is the friend of sinners. He's the justifier of those of us who have run out of excuses. He is our Lord, our Savior, our God. And in his name, you are welcome to church this morning. And now we're gonna stand up and rehearse some more truth together. Amen. 
up and down. Let's stand up together. We're going to do a responsive reading. Uh, our typical reading uh, response rhythm is that I read the leader portion, you read the all portion. This morning, we're going to read every section of it. This is an all together prayer, okay? Uh, we have the chance today as we start this new series, we consider ways in which we have held on to our life and not entrusted it to the Lord to come before him in confession this morning. And so we're going to read this prayer of confession uh, and uh, I'll, let's, let's, let's just join our voices together as we continue our service. Pr uh, say this with me. Pray this with me. You ask for my hands that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. Continue reading. You asked for my mouth to speak out your name. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You ask for my eyes to see the pain of this world. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You ask for my life, that you might work through me. I gave only a small part, that I might not lose control. Lord, forgive our calculated efforts to serve you, only when it is comfortable to do so, only in those places where it is safe to do so, and only to those who make it easy to do so. Father, forgive us, renew us, send us out as a usable instrument that we might take seriously the meaning of your cross, that we might remember that we are not our own, we belong to you. Amen? Amen. Let's continue singing together today. Be reminded that you are his, and because you are his, this morning his mercy is new towards you. His mercy is more. Let's continue to sing this together. One, two, three, four, five, six. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sing of his love today. What love can remember the wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their song. Thrown into a sea with the bottom or shore.
where our worth is today. It's in King Jesus. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth. you make that true of our lives, that we might be satisfied only in you, with the things of this world, the things that we love to, to blo- boast in and cling on to, Lord, fade into the distance. As we look to the cross, as we look to your sacrifice, God, we boast in the work of Christ alone. God, speak now through your word as we sit under it. Would we look more like Jesus after today is our prayer. And everyone said together, amen. Well, friends, you have a few minutes to greet those around you as Christ has welcomed you. Welcome those around you. If you need to check your kids in, you can do that. And we'll come back in just a moment. Thanks for singing.
protector and provider I know that you are near Even when surrounded By evil, sin and strife Your steadfast love and mercy Are with me all my life And even in the valley Of death I will not fear Protector and provider I know All right, everybody, grab your, grab your coffee, fill it up. We're going to get started in just a minute here. So go ahead and find your way to your seat. If you need a Bible, there's some blue Bibles, uh, I believe, on the back table there. Grab one of those. Uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, so give you a minute to get settled. And then Barrett's going to read for us this morning. So, yeah, come on, grab your seat. And I want to invite you to, I'll invite you to stand as we uh, read together. Good morning. Hi, uh, would you open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 1. Um, this morning we'll be reading from verses 1 through 13, and if you have a blue Bible, it's, in, it's on page 3. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. But he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for you and for your word and for your communication to us through it. God, we long for you to shape us through what your word says. We ask that you would grant us a deeper understanding of your character, your heart, your design, and your care for us. We look to you to speak to us and to change us through your word this morning. We also pray the same for our children as they are in their classes right now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Uh, thanks, Barrett, for reading for us. Um, much appreciated. We are uh, kicking a new series off this morning. We're going to take a break from the book of Acts for uh, four weeks. We often do this right after Easter, spend some time kind of in a relevant topic for a few weeks, just give ourselves a breath, and then we'll come back to uh, Acts again in about a month's time. But we're going to spend actually the next four weeks uh, thinking about what it means for us that we are not our own. We're going to think about what that means uh, for how we think about ourselves. We're going to think about what that means for how we think about the stuff of life. We're going to consider what that means for the way we think about sexuality. And finally, we're going to consider what that means for the ways that we think about politics. Some very uncontroversial topics for your next four weeks here. Now, the impetus for this series uh, really comes from us as pastors uh, seeing and considering and discussing and reading about a, a shift that we are increasingly seeing in our current cultural moment. And that shift has to do really with how we as individuals discover and define and identify who we are. Who are you? You know, for millennia, that has been a question that humans have asked. Over the last half century, the way that we answer that question, at least in the Western world, the places that we look to for authority and meaning and identity, the ways that we understand ourselves in the Western world, that has changed significantly over the last 50 years. What do I mean by that? Well, let me, let me illustrate it for you through what is always a, a helpful litmus test of cultural trends, and that is Walt Disney. 30 years ago now, back in June of 1994, uh, Disney released what probably still is, in my opinion, one of the greatest Disney movies of all time, The Lion King. I was 13 years old. I was about to end eighth grade, uh, probably thought that I was far too cool for cartoons, but my, my family went to the movie anyway, and I found myself at the theater uh, captivated by this storyline. The Elton John soundtrack... The emotional moments, it still gets me watching the movie, the moment that Mufasa dies. Anyone feel me there? But it's interesting that the plot line of The Lion King really follows Simba on this journey of self-discovery that he takes. It's a pattern that's reflective of what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey. The spoiler alert for those of you that haven't seen the movie, what starts to happen is after his dad dies... Simba ends up racked with shame and guilt. And that shame and guilt, he feels like he's caused his father's death and it, it sends him into exile. He ends up leaving the pride lands. He, he runs away and he runs away from who he is and from what he's done. And what starts to happen as we, as we watch the movie go along is that we see these other characters around Simba. They begin to help Simba come back to who he is. And there's this epic moment where Simba really realizes who he is. Rafiki, right, you know, the baboon, he, he helps him come into this encounter with his dad again. And his dad speaks from the clouds. It's this great, deep, powerful James Earl Jones, Jones voice. And this voice comes to Simba from the clouds. Simba, remember who you are. You are my son, 
and the one true king. And as Simba, as Simba hears this truth from outside of himself, he, he comes back to who he actually is. Now, almost 20 years after The Lion King, Disney released another blockbuster, iconic, culture-shaping movie. And having four daughters at the time that it was released, I know it well, it's the movie Frozen. And it's interesting that Frozen, just like The Lion King, follows this royal child on their journey of self-discovery. It's the hero's journey, but there's a difference here. You see, at the beginning of the movie, just like Simba, Elsa, the main character, what does she do? She runs away. She goes into exile. But she does that not like Simba does because she's just unable to accept who she actually is. No, she runs away. Why? Because others won't accept who she actually is. You see, Simba's journey is all about him overcoming his own shame and guilt so that he can actually accept this identity that's been given to him. Elsa's journey, on the other hand, is all about her overcoming the repression, and we might even say the oppression of others so that she can express her identity, so that she can be true to herself. And so she sings this epic song. We all know it, right? I'll have to confess that I've sung it at the top of my lungs multiple times, maybe a few of those times dressed in princess garb and dressing with my, and dancing with my daughters. Let it go. Listen to these words Elsa sings. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Exactly what you want your five-year-old daughter learning, right? <laughs> See, Frozen and The Lion King are, are very similar and yet very different stories. Simba's journey is all about him accepting this identity that's been given to him. Elsa's journey is all about her expressing and identifying with this internal identity. Simba's identity comes from his dad and his community. For Elsa, she's the only one who really knows who she is, and that needs to be accepted by others around her. Do you see see the difference here between these two stories? Now, I'm not the first person to notice this difference. This has been remarked on by numerous writers and thinkers, but at the heart of this difference, friends, the difference between these two stories is where we locate our source of identity and authority. How do we answer this question? Who am I? Elsa's story is really, friends, the the modern story of the self. There's so many other places that we could look in movies, music, culture, that I could point to that tell the same story, that the way to self-discovery, the way to find your true self is to throw off the expectations that others put on you, these constraints of society, these constraints of authority. What you have to do is you have to get out from under those so that you can look inward and start to live out the true, authentic you. Do you recognize that? Give me an mm mm-hmm if you feel that. Now, let me just say to be clear that this way of thinking isn't just out there. This sermon series is not gonna be about how horrible the culture is becoming and how we are just going to hell in a handbasket and how we need as, a, as Christians to insulate ourselves from those influences. No, what, what I'm actually saying is that this trend, this shift, this this inward turn to what sociologist Robert Bella calls expressive individualism. This is really the water that we swim in. It's the, it's the air that every one of us breathes day in and day out. And so what we're trying to do through this series is number one, make us aware of this shift. And I'm going to do that by really synthesizing a lot of people that have thought about this at a lot deeper levels than I have. So there's nothing original that I'm going to say. I've probably read more for this series than I have for any series recently. That's not a pat on the back for me. It's saying, I really don't know a whole lot. 
And there's a lot of people that know more than I do. In fact, we're going to put out a reading list that if you're interested in some book recommendations, you'll be able to dive into some stuff that's really helpful. So number one, the goal of this series is to make us aware of this inward turn. Number two, it's to help us frame that turn. It's to help us frame ourselves in light of what God has to say about us through his word. Who is it that we are according to this book? And so this morning, I think there's no better place really for us to start thinking about these things than for us to go back to the very beginning of our Bibles, to this passage that Barrett read for us this morning in Genesis chapter 3. I very simply this morning just want to give us four thoughts to chew on as we open this series. I want us to see here in the beginning of our Bibles what I want to call this morning the good of individualism, the issue with individualism, the impact of individualism, and finally the redemption of individualism. So the good, the issue, the impact and the redemption of individualism. And I apologize to you in advance that I didn't have my best pastor skills this week, so I wasn't able to alliterate those four, but you're gonna get the point as we go along. So if you got your Bibles, open them up here to Genesis chapter three. Let's dive into this passage together. Number one, the first thing I wanna show you this morning is actually the good of individualism the good of individualism. I I, I say that because it's important for us right right up front, before I give any critique of individualism, I, I wanna give a caveat for you this morning that the Bible is not anti individual. In fact, what we find right from the beginning of our Bibles is that even before the fall, God creates and cares about unique, distinct individuals. Genesis 1, you you know the story, what happens in Genesis chapter 1. God creates humans, he creates them male and female, he creates them with dignity and worth, he creates them with the ability to know God, to know one another, and the ability to know themselves. It's interesting, at the end of Genesis chapter 2, right before this passage that we read this morning, we get this beautiful picture of God joining together this man and this woman. It's the world's first wedding. And at the end of that wedding, there's this provocative statement. If you got your Bibles open, look down at it with me. The writer of Genesis says this, chapter two, verse 24. He writes this, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now that statement is provocative, not because of its intimate allusions. That statement would have been provocative to the original readers of this because it would have cut against the grain of everything in their culture. Now in modern culture, we all know that if a couple gets married and They head out on their honeymoon, and if they were to come home from that honeymoon and settle in the husband's childhood bedroom, across the hall from the in-laws, that would be weird. It would be awkward. It would be strange. But the reality is that it it was not that way in ancient cultures. In fact, in, in traditional societies, this is still true across the world in places outside of the West. There, there is nothing more important in life within an ancient culture than closeness and commitment to your family and your tribe and your community. And so the idea that's put forward here, the end of Genesis chapter two, that someone would grow up and that they would mature and that in that maturing, they would leave one family unit to start a whole new family unit, that they wouldn't be bound by the traditional authority structures of their society, that they would start to actually emerge into a life that they determined on their own. That would have been incredibly controversial 5,000 years ago. And yet it's exactly what the Bible gives to us. The Bible, friends, is not anti-individual. In fact, over and over, there's so many ways we could trace this out. The Bible pushes against unhealthy, abusive structures of authority within society. The Bible stresses over and over authentic experiences, emotions. The, The Bible doesn't discourage us from being aware of our inward life. You see this over and over. You see it in in God calling Abraham away from 
all that he knew, his family, his tribe, his homeland. You see it in Jesus calling the disciples away from the vocation of their family, away from everything they knew to follow him. You see it in the psalmist and the way that they wrestle with these existential feelings, the way that they, they turn inward and, and bring those feelings toward God. God is not anti-individual. There's so many places that we could see that God cares about us personally and uniquely, that he is for us as his creatures, knowing and authentically expressing ourselves as individuals. There's good to individualism. However, what Genesis 3 starts to show us as we turn there is that when that individualism pushes out God, there's an issue that starts to arise. And so this is what I want you to see, number two, the issue with individualism. If you've got your Bibles, follow along with me, the issue of individualism. Let's read again what happens here. Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Now, I, I want you to notice here that what, what the serpent is trying to do here in this moment is to spin this lie about God and about the goodness of God's authority. Continue reading. And the woman said to the servant, serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, friends, let me ask you, there's, there's so much going on here, but I want to get to the heart of this. What is the fundamental issue at stake here in this first temptation? At the heart of this temptation, and goodness, this is the lie that is spun out century after century after century for humanity. It, the lie is this, that God doesn't really care about your good. That God doesn't care about your good. In fact, God is a barrier to you becoming all that you could really be. And so life under God, life under his authority, life with God defining the rules, life with God setting the boundaries for you, my goodness, that constraint, that is a prison that needs to be thrown off if you are going to truly be the unique, authentic, true you. Friends, that's the lie. At the heart of humanity's fall in the garden is this inward turn, this turn to throw off authority and start defining ourselves to become God ourselves. That's the fundamental lie of the garden and it continues to be the fundamental lie of the modern world, this idea that we are our own. Now, if you've grown up like most of us have in Western culture, that, that idea that we are our own, that, that has shaped us on so many levels. It's honestly what so many of us just subconsciously operate in. You go back 250 years to the very beginning of the Enlightenment and one of the, one of the f philosophical turns of that moment what was this turn inward toward the self. Immanuel Kant, who was one of the fathers of the Enlightenment, he wrote this famous essay, What is Enlightenment? And in it, he said this, Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. And for Kant, what that immaturity was, he defined it this way. He said that immaturity is man's inability to use their understanding without the guidance of another. In other words, it's, it's this uh, boundedness we have to those outside of ourselves, to outside authority, to not think for ourselves. And so for Kant, the motto of the Enlightenment was this, to have the courage to use your own understanding 
For him, that was a rejection of any other authority. It was this, this statement really to, to look inward to find who we truly are. And from there, there's so many other influence, uh, influences on this that we could trace. I'm not gonna spend time tracing the history of it, but, but what it comes down to is that now in our modern culture, over the last three centuries, where we've come to is that really the idea that we should reject authority that we should reject the input of anyone outside of ourselves and be true to ourselves and follow our heart and find ourselves and live our truth, however our culture phrases it. That move to live out our true self is seen now in our culture as the most brave, daring, courageous thing we can do. It's now the highest moral virtue of society. Back in 2017, uh, Jeep ran a TV spot for their new Jeep Renegade. And the slogan of their ad campaign was, be unique, be authentic. And what the commercial on TV had was this female pop star, uh, Halsey, some of you might know the name. She, She was talking about what that meant to be unique, to be authentic, what that meant for her. And she said this, I have chosen to be unapologetically me. Because I'm unafraid, she says, every time someone wants me to be quiet, I speak louder. I am Halsey Renegade. (laughs) See, this is what I'm talking about. In our modern world, we're almost just irresistibly pulled toward this idea that we, we have this unique calling. We might even call it a moral, spiritual, existential obligation that we have to discover and define ourselves. And so what do we feel? We feel compelled to live out our own unique way of being human, to express ourselves through these unique, authentic lives. In fact, if we, if we don't express those identities, if we don't authentically live out who we inwardly think we are, if we're not true to ourselves, we feel like we've missed the point of our entire life. That idea has become so much a part of the air that we breathe, it's almost hard to imagine a world where anyone would think different. Let me give you a funny example of how that plays out. Did you know that 150 years ago, uh, more than half of newborn baby boys were given one of the 10 most common names? John, Henry, William, James. I mean, if you were to go to a Civil War memorial, you might find the odd uh, Mordecai or Jedediah. But overall, you're, you're not gonna find much outside of those top 10. 2024, though, guess what percentage of boys are given those, one of those top 10 names? 5%. Jean Twingy, in her book, Generations, she said that parents don't worry anymore about giving their child a name that's too unusual. What they worry about is giving their child a name that's too common. Why? Because we feel like it's our mission in life. And we bring our kids along on this mission to express this authentic, unique self for them to be authentic and unique themselves. Because this is our calling to live out these lives that find who we truly are on the inside. Now, I'm not trying to call you out this morning if you don't have a daughter named Jennifer or a son named Bradley, you have some other spelling, don't feel guilty sitting in your seat. What I'm trying to show you though is how much this is just the water that we swim in. And here's the thing, what starts to happen, this is the temptation of the garden is that if we throw off these shackles of everything imposed on us from the outside, including God, if we just live out our own unique truth, friends, who is it then that becomes the ultimate arbiter of right and wrong? Who decides good and evil? It's us. We become the ultimate authority. Our inner feelings become the moral law of the universe. It's what Alistair McIntyre in his book, After Virtue, he called it emotivism. Emotivism, this idea that our moral choices ultimately boil down to just a matter of preference. This is wrong because I feel it's wrong, but it might be right for you because you feel it's right for you. And so what starts to happen is to make 
a, a moral judgment about something or someone, it makes sense of why making moral judgments starts to feel in our culture, not just like it's a claim about what's true and what's not, but it starts to feel like it's actually an exercise of power, even for some people like an act of oppression to make that moral judgment, to put that on someone else. You feel me here at all? This is the world we live in. Now, let me pull this all together because here's the way this starts to play out. And I, I know that some of you sadly have seen this or even been a part of it. I've had friends, e even Christian friends who are married, they have a spouse, they have kids, and they, they come to a point sometimes in their late 20s, sometimes in their 30s, they come to this point where they, they look around and who they are on the inside feels like it's not who they were meant to be. They don't feel fulfilled. They don't feel significant. They don't feel like they're expressing themselves. And we live in this world increasingly where there are just so many options, aren't there? And so the question starts to get asked, what if I weren't in this marriage? What if I were more fulfilled sexually? What if I didn't have these kids holding back my career ambitions? What if, what if, what if? And trust me, all of us have those what if questions, but what starts to happen, and I've seen this happen, is that one or even both of those spouses, what they start to think is that their real, satisfying, authentic life can only be found on the other side of that marriage, on the other side of that family. And so what do they do? They do Elsa. They abandon these things that feel like a prison to them and they make the courageous decision to be true to themselves. And what happens in our modern age where the ideal of individualism is the highest moral good, what can, what can happen is that it actually starts to feel like no matter how many people those decisions hurt, it starts to feel like it would actually be immoral and inauthentic for that person not to follow that path. That it would be wrong for us even as friends to get in the way of what that person feels like is right and good for them. Do you see the issue here with individualism? It's the issue with an individualism untethered from God and from his authority. You see, just like in the garden, on, on the surface, there is this compelling, invigorating, freeing promise. You'll, you'll find yourself. But in the end, that promise is totally empty. We, we live in this moment, friends, where we've never been more free to discover and express ourselves. We're more free to do that than any culture ever. I mean, for most of human history, guys, do you know what you would do for a vocation? Yeah, you do exactly what your dad did. Ladies, do you know what you would do? Exactly what your mom did. And yet in the last hundred years, we're, we're free now to do whatever we want. We can make whatever choice we want. Wealth, technology, education, transportation, all of those things have made it possible for us to live with a million options to discover and express who we are, to be these incredibly unique people who live authentically the, the amazing uniqueness of our incredibly unique lives. But let me ask you, how's it working out for us? How's it working out for us? The reality is that by every metric as a society, we are more anxious, tired, depressed, isolated than ever before. And so I want to take you very briefly, number three, to the impact of individualism. We've seen the issue. Let's see the impact. Adam and Eve in the garden, they, they take this fruit and they, they eat. And Genesis 3-7 says that then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. You see, they, they throw off God's authority and they do see in a way that they've never seen before, but it's not enlightenment that they experience, is it? What is it? It's shame. It's shame. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And so there's this fallout that we start to see. Instead of them discovering and expressing themselves, what do we see? There's a brokenness that they begin to feel with themselves. They're full of shame. They hide. 
And there's a brokenness they begin to feel with God. They go from this intimate relationship with God to now this relationship of fear and uncertainty. And there's a brokenness that comes in their community, in their relationship with one another. What happens? They start to blame each other. And they start to see each other not, not as these gifts from God to help one another. They start to see one another as an obstacle to their own happiness. Friends, all three of those things are part and parcel of the fallout of individualism. You, know, you look at the problems of culture today, and, and this isn't meant to be a rant. It's not meant to be a pile-on to our culture. It's just being honest because these problems are out there. For many of us, they're our own problems. The rise in narcissism, the absence out there of compassion in society, social media addiction, the, the drop overall in what, what, what sociologists call the happiness index, that's just continued to drop. In fact, we are the first generation of Americans to look out at the future and not feel more hope for the future than we did for the past. This statistic struck me incredibly that 40% of high schoolers recently surveyed say that it's hard for them to find hope for the world. I mean, these are our young people, right? It's the old people that are supposed to be curmudgeonly and grumpy and cynical. And it's our young people. What's happened is that for many people, the, the overwhelming pressure of having to discover and define ourselves to be these authentic, uniquely expressed lives in the world, this pressure to make our impact and be the determiner of our, our own meaning and our own purpose and our own morality, really this pressure to function as our own God, that, friends, is exhausting. We weren't made to be God. And so the freedom that that promises actually just turns out to be a different kind of slavery. George MacDonald was a Scotsman whose writing inspired C.S. Lewis. He once wrote that the one principle of hell is this, I am my own. I am my own. And what he meant for sure was that it's that lie of the serpent that sends us to hell in an ultimate sense. But I think part of what he meant as well is that that statement, that principle, I am my own, it creates hell in our lives. It creates hell in our relationships. It creates hell in our churches. It creates hell in our marriages. It creates hell everywhere it goes to say that I am my own. And the reality, maybe you, maybe you haven't run all the way down the road and where that statement takes you, but the reality is that all of us have believed that lie in the garden, haven't we? To some degree, this is every one of our problems. We, we want on some level to rule our lives, to be our own, to be the master of our own fate, to be the captain of our own soul, and it destroys us. It destroys us. The question then is, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Well, the answer is yes. And not just hope, there's redemption. There's redemption. That's the fourth thing that I want to show you here, the, the redemption of individualism. You see, Genesis 3 doesn't just end with the fallout of rebellion. There's these glimmers of God's grace all over this story. Right? You heard it as Barrett read, God ends up seeking out Adam and Eve, he comes to them not with lightning bolts from the sky. He comes to them in gentleness, finding them in their hiding. And if we were to continue to read, what we find is God finds them. And in fact, he, he clothes them. He clothes their nakedness, even sacrificing an animal to cover them with animal skins. God's grace glimmers all over this passage. And he ends up giving this promise. It's a promise down here in Genesis 3.15. Let me read it for you. He says this, I will put enmity between you. He's speaking here to the serpent, by the way. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God gives this promise that one day there will be one of Eve's offspring who will defeat this lie of the serpent forever, who will actually crush his head. 
Now, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he knelt down in a garden praying. We, we saw this just a week ago. If you were at our, our Good Friday service, we spent time in this moment. And it was in that garden as Jesus prayed that what, who the Bible tells us was the second Adam, Jesus himself. He faced a very similar moment to this first Adam in the garden. You see, here was the choice for Jesus. The choice for Jesus was this, throw off my father's authority and discover and define my own life or submit to the identity and the purpose that I've been given. A purpose that we know for Jesus was not pleasant, a purpose that would end up leading Jesus ultimately to execution and to death. And in that moment in the garden, what was Jesus's prayer? Not my will, not my will, not my inward feelings, not my inward desires, but your will be done. Friends, how do we escape the lie of individualism? How do we, how do we find redemption? The title of this sermon series actually comes from an ancient catechism. It was a catechism written all the way back in Germany in the 17th century, and it, it begins with this question. I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's the Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. It asks this, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the answer it gives is this, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for my sins, and listen to this, has set me free from the power of the devil. Friends, freedom, real freedom for us, is not found in us trying to find ourselves. It's actually found in us losing ourselves. This is what Jesus taught, right, that those who try to save their life, those who try to make life all about themselves, those who, who try to just search out their own identity and, and express themselves, what will happen to your life? Ultimately, in some sense, you will lose it. But it's actually in losing your life to Christ that you find it. You see, what the gospel shows us, friends, is that our true self isn't found by searching for some inner essence inside of us. It's found in submission to the one who through his own submission, through his own death, saved us from ourselves. And in a culture now of self, for us in this culture of self, for us to say, friends, I am not my own, for us to say that, for us to really believe that ultimate authority doesn't lie with us, for us to admit that we are broken, that we are rebels against God's authority, for us to admit that Jesus is king, and for us to then submit our lives to him, for us to abandon our attempts to rule our own lives and just fall back into the arms of Jesus's grace, there is not a more countercultural thing that we can do in this moment than that. And that, that reality is what will ultimately free us. Rowan Williams, the archbishop, former archbishop of Canterbury, he put it this way, I love this quote, he says this, it's where I want to end this morning. We'll put it up here. He says this, you have an identity, not because you have invented one or because you have a little core of selfhood that is unchanged, but because you have a witness of who you are. So what you don't understand or see, the bits of yourself that you can't pull together in a convincing story are held together in a convincing gaze of love. You don't have to work out and finalize who you are. You don't have to settle the absolute truth of your history or your story because in the eyes of the presence that never goes away, all that you've been and all that you are is still present and real. It is held together in that unifying gaze. Friends, we have a savior who has loved us unto death. And the invitation for us is to submit our lives to one who cares about us more deeply than we care about ourselves. We can finally free ourselves from 
the burden of trying to create and discover endlessly our own unique identity. God's already given you, friends, all the identity you need, that in Christ you are a beloved child of God. And so real freedom isn't found in just being true to yourself as defined by yourself. Real freedom is found in being true to the God who has defined you, who has made you and who saved you, that you might live for him. You are not your own. You belong to Christ. And that's the best news that we could possibly hear this morning. We're gonna begin to work that out next week through how we think about our stuff in a world of consumerism, through how we think about our sexuality in a world gone mad, and through how we think about politics in a world of tribalism. Friends, you are not your own but belong body and soul to the one who gave his life for you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you've done in redeeming us. We confess that for so many of us, there's just ways, even if we believe that you are king, there's ways that we've lived with ourself at the throne. There's ways that we've seen you and your agenda being subservient to us and our agenda. Lord, help us through this series to look honestly at ourselves, at the places where we have attempted to rule and reign our own lives. Remind us that we are not our own and that that's the best news on planet earth. In your name we pray, amen. Can we stand and remind our hearts, remind each other that Jesus is better anything this world has to offer us and anything that we believe let's sing this together there is no other so sure and steady my hope is held in your hand when castles crumble and death is fleeting upon this rock I will stand Upon this rock I will stand. Glory, glory, we have no other key but Jesus, Lord of all. Raise the anthem, our loudest praise. is better make my heart believe in every victory Jesus is better make my heart believe any comfort this world in any comfort Jesus is better
as we move to the table. Such a good day to be together. Amen. It's a good word this morning. Amen. We need to hear that. Uh, we need to hear that. And I don't know if you're like me, I also need the table this morning. Uh, as we come to the table this morning, we got to remind ourselves, say, the table, as we, as we remember the, the body and the blood of Jesus, the table confronts us. And it confronts us with this reality that we need a Savior and we are not in. Amen? We are not in. We cannot save ourselves. We are not our own Savior. We need someone from outside of us. The table confronts us. But the table also comforts us. It invites us and says, come and remember, you don't have to be your own Savior. Amen? You don't have to be your own Savior because someone has already done everything for you. Jesus lived the life you and I failed to live. He died the death we should have died. And he rose, defeating sin in the grave. He's done all the work for us. And we just get to come now and embrace and receive and rest in this reality that we don't have to be our own Savior. Jesus is our Savior. Amen. So as you come this morning to the table, just delight your heart in that. Let, let the table confront you. You're not your own Savior. But let it also comfort you. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. He already did it for you. So the way we, we celebrate the Lord's table here at Summit, we have five tables. There's three in the back, two up front at each table. There's a choice of juice or wine. There's gluten-free bread. And so as you feel led, come to the table. There'll be someone there serving you, praying with you, directing you. And just come and delight your heart in the reality that you do have a Savior. It's not you. It's Jesus. Let me pray, and then when you feel led, come to the table. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning confessing that it's, it's so easy for us to fall into the traps that we talked about this morning and just think that there is, there is freedom in defining ourselves, freedom in, in this being our own. But we, we thank you that your word confronts us with the reality, the the bondage that is found. So we just, we witness it so clearly there in Genesis 3. But we thank you that as we see that we're not, we're not left in that place of feeling overwhelmed or frustrated or discouraged. But that there is redemption. There's salvation. And Lord Jesus, you, you have done everything to give us that salvation. And we don't have to, to jump through a bunch of hoops or check off a bunch of boxes to receive it. We just need to come to you and rest in the finished work of what you've done. And I thank you that each week as we gather together around the table, we get to delight our hearts in that. That you have done everything to save us. That we need a Savior, we are not it, but you are it. So I pray that as we, as we gather around the table this morning, um, you would meet us as only you can in this place. Assure us of your grace. Assure us of this reality that, that you have us and that you've done everything necessary to save us. Help us to light our hearts in the reality that we are not our own, but we belong to you. These things we pray in your name. Amen. As you feel led, come to the table.
All right. Well, as you take your seat, uh, a couple quick announcements before I send you on your way. First, if you are uh, new or visiting here, if you're first Sunday here at Summit, we're glad you're here. want to welcome you. Uh, there's at the Connect area over there, we've got welcome bags. If it's your first time and you've never received a welcome bag, pop by there afterwards, uh, drop a Connect card off there, and there's a little gift bag with uh, a coupon for a free book and a free coffee. You'll want to grab that and take that with you. It's our gift to you uh, for joining us this morning. A couple of things for for newcomers as well. Uh, coming up in the next month, we've got a couple of events coming up. One of those is our newcomers lunch, which will be happening Sunday after service, uh, May the 5th. Um, if you're interested in being a part of that, you've never come to a newcomer's lunch, even if you've been here several months and you're just uh, wanting to get connected and find out a little bit more about who we are here at Summit, newcomer's lunch is a great way to do that. Uh, you just stick around after service, sign up on our website or on the Church Center app, uh, or we have a physical sign up over there at the Connect desk. Um, let us know that you want to come and then we'll be able to prepare enough food. Great chance for you to just get to know a little bit of who we are here at Summit. Uh, second, if you are interested in membership at Summit, we've got a membership class coming up uh, Saturday, May the 18th. It goes from 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. Um, we often say, if you've been here a while, we say the membership class is not like a timeshare presentation. We don't shut all the curtains, lock the door, and not let you out until you sign on the dotted line that you're going to stick around at Summit. No, it's just a great chance for you to understand a little bit deeper uh, what convictions drive us at Summit. What is it that we think about the church? What is it that we think about what it means to be plugged into a church? And so get signed up for that as well. We'd love to have you come uh, 9 till 12, Saturday, May the 18th. Uh, also a reminder, we kicked off this morning our 845 equip hour, uh, equip 45 minutes, 845 till 930. We've got a couple of classes happening. Eat This Book is happening, which is a great introduction to the Bible. Um, come on out to those. You don't need to sign up. Sign up's kind of over. We've got a sense of numbers. Just come out uh, next week, 845, right back here in the band and choir rooms. We'd love to have you uh, join in with us for those classes. Other things that are happening, be sure to check your bulletin, read what's happening in there, uh, sign up for our newsletter, and stay up to date with all the events that are happening in the life of the church. But I want to invite you now uh, to stand, and I want to send you out uh, into the places that you live, work, learn, play with the reminder of God's grace for you in Christ. This week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go out in his peace and we'll see you next week. Have a great week.